Hi there, this is a remake of our previous video. It had a lot of issues and we've tried to clean it up and add control room graphics, uh, more information. It was really a quick video, never really intended to go anywhere, but we're gonna try to remake it. This is a 580 megawatt coal plant. Uh, it puts out 580 megawatts net. Uh, it puts about 610 megawatts gross. It takes 30 megawatts to run the plant. This is where the rail cars are unloaded, the dumper building. Uh, the trains come in, about 110 cars. It uses a rotary dumper where the cars are dumped out the top. Uh, it takes about five, six hours to dump a 110 car train. From here, the coal goes out these belts to a stacker. It can be dumped in either pile. These are also reclaimers that can be used to reclaim the coal. From here, it goes into the crusher building then it's fed up into the plant and fills four silos on each side of the plant. Um, here's the precipitator, uh, the stack. The plant is running this day and there's not much for emissions coming out. This is where the bottom ash ends up out here, the ash farm. Also the fly ash will end up in these domes and is used for concrete. Here's the intake structure. This is the power block. This is where the boiler is uh, the top and the boiler is suspended from the ceiling so it allows it to grow down. Back here is the generator building, the control room would sit right back in here. Okay, this is one of our first control room graphic screens. Um, it's easier to visualize what's going on with these one line diagrams. There's a lot of equipment in the plant and we're going through it really quick. Uh, some of the stuff is really hard to explain um, or make sense going through so fast. The first thing we'll see is the turbine lube oil tank. Uh, the tank has the DC bearing oil pump on top, the AC bearing oil pump, the ejectors inside, and we also have the seal oil pump. A normal operation, you have your main lube oil pump on the end of the turbine shaft. High pressure oil comes down to the lube oil tank. There's an ejector that takes high pressure low flow oil and converts low pressure high flow. Part of this oil is used to feed the suction to the pump. Uh, lube oil tanks on the first floor, turbines on the third floor. Some of the high pressure oil is used for seal oil backup for your hydrogen seals and the overspeed and a few other little items. Um, the bearing lube oil goes through the lube oil coolers and then it's fed out to all the bearings. Uh, this unit has a intermediate pressure turbine, high pressure turbine, and two low pressure turbines. Each low pressure turbine has its own surface condenser hot well. Uh, these are bearing lift pumps. They are to keep the shaft off the bearings when it's on turning gear, provide high pressure oil, and float the shaft. Okay, this is a turbine lube oil tank. Over here is the auxiliary cooling water pumps. Talk about those later. We have the d -min transfer pumps. Um, this is the reservoir holds about 10,000 gallons of turbine oil 32. This is the filter oil dehydrator. These are the aux cooling water pumps. They provide cooling for the plant. Uh, back in here is the surface condenser. This is the dryer back here. It pulls a vacuum on the oil and the oil is heated to strip out any moisture in the oil. We have filters that take out any varnish forming material. This is the surface condenser back here. This is the vacuum dryer. Heater sits down below. Um, the little ejector back here that pulls a vacuum on it. So the main purpose is getting the moisture out of the oil, which forms sludge and can be detrimental. Over here is the condensate pumps, but this is the front of the surface condenser. These are all the drain lines coming back to the surface condenser. They're used for startup in various conditions. This is the lube oil cooler. See those on the screen? There's two of them. Okay, this is the condensate system. Uh, we have two surface condensers for each low pressure turbine. The condensate goes to the condensate pumps. From there, it goes to the polishers. Uh, they're resin beds with cat and anion resin, which cleans up any impurities in the water. From there, it goes to the gland steam condenser. 
This is any excess steam from the turbine ceiling. From here it goes to your deaerator level control valves. Uh, it goes to feed water heaters 1A, 1B, and 2. These are inside the surface condenser. Uh, feed water he is on, heater 3 is on third floor. This deaerator is on the ninth floor. And these are down on the first floor. Okay, here's the condensate pumps, condensate discharge valves, condensate header. They run about 330 pounds. This is the surface condenser. These are the water boxes on the two surface condensers. Uh, it takes about 180,000 gallons of water a minute for cooling. This down the condensate pit underneath. This would be the water going in. There's two inlet lines and two outlet lines. Back here, this is where you check for leaks in the condensate system. Any raw water leaks, you can sample underneath the rows of tubes and see where the potential leak is in the tubes. We have a pump back here for pumping out the hot well in the system. This is kind of the condensate pit down underneath the first floor. That there's the transfer pump that moves condensate out. Here's your main condensate line coming in. Um, these are the minimum flow recirc valves. Uh, these pumps have to have minimum flow on them. So there's a little recirc valve that maintains minimum flow. Okay, this is the circ water screen, uh, circulating water. We pump water out of the reservoir through traveling screens uh, through the pumps. We use filtered water for shaft lube water and also keeping dirt out of the shaft. Uh, it feeds up to both surface condensers. The water goes in one side, it loops back through and comes out the other. It counterflows to minimize uh, the heat it provides more of a uniform uh, temperature removal. Have a vacuum tank, vacuum pumps. These pull a vacuum on the upper tubes, keep any air out, so the surface condenser doesn't air lock. The seal structure helps minimize pump power usage by creating kind of a, s a siphon effect. These are the water box of the surface condensers. You got the drain valves on the side and your main butterfly valves. Those are drain valves, main butterfly valves, uh, sample panel. Boy, there are chemicals that are inducted up above. Okay, these are the condenser vacuum pumps. Uh, it's critical to have good vacuum to get maximum efficiency out of your steam turbine. These are liquid ring vacuum pumps. There's two of them that run in series for high vacuum and for startup they'll run in parallel so they can pull more vacuum or kind of a hogging mode. They're very durable pumps since you're using water for your ceiling. This is one of the vacuum pumps. Uh, this is your water collection tank. You have a heat exchanger on the side. You have your two pumps. This is your main pump. This is the secondary for creating higher vacuum. Here's the other pump. Um, have your main pump liquid ring. Water comes in and the water's flung and the water actually does the, the sealing and pulls in the air. Okay, this is sewer oil system. Uh, this is a menagerie of piping, so this is the best way to see it is with this drawing. Basically, you use oil to seal the hydrogen in the generator. There's a seal ring. Here you have the seal side hydrogen pump. This goes on the ring and the oil goes inside towards the generator. Uh, the other side is your air side. It goes in and it flows out. Um, any oil that comes out 
it's mixed in with the bearing oil as your bearings sit right here by the seal. So part of the oil goes in as collected and the other part comes out with the bearing oil. Then it goes to like a bearing enlargement where any hydrogen gas is removed from it. Um, this has a backup DC pump and if this fails then you can also use your main turbine bearing oil. This is a quick overview of it. Uh, the actual pictures of it are pretty confusing. Case of seal oil skid. Uh, you have heat exchangers on it. Uh, temperature control for the air side and the hydrogen side. I'm going to maintain about 12 pounds higher oil than the hydrogen side of the generator. Back here, this is our panel for monitoring the purity of the hydrogen. The polishers sit back here. That's your generator breaker back here. Back here is one of your polisher pumps for regenerating. Fire system for the transformers. They hold about 14,000 gallons of oil, so a fire would be detrimental. Now here's your hydrogen analyzer panel. When you purge, when you shut down, you purge the hydrogen out with carbon dioxide. Then at that, you use dry instrument air. When you come out of the outage, you purge with carbon dioxide, and then you put the hydrogen back in. It's critical to not mix hydrogen and air any explosive mixtures. This is the generator breaker air compressor. It puts out about 3200 psi and the pressure is dropped. That gives a drying effect on the air. This will run your generator breaker. The polishers sit back here. Okay, generator voltage control screen. Uh, the big thing on this, this is the generator breakers. We're going to see the air compressor. This is the final pressure going into the breakers. Each phase has its own breaker. The transformers step the voltage up to 500,000. Each phase has a transformer. You have a unit transformer that takes the 24,000 volts off the generator, drops it to 7,200 volts for in-plant use. You have your static exciter controls breaker have condition monitor. This looks for a particulate in the hydrogen gas stream. If you have insulation breaking down the generator. Radio frequency monitor. This looks for shorts. Uh, if you have an arcing or a short, it'll give you a higher frequency and this thing will pick it up. Also have a power system stabilizer. Tries to take the swing out of the power systems. Okay, these are generator breakers here. Each phase has one. Generator breaker control panel. Here's your condition monitor, sits right here. Generator breaker control panel's down there. Each phase has a breaker. This is the isophase cooler, just went past. This is where the current coming out of the generator is monitored. Uh, comes through these wi wires, then there's a Transformer around it measures the amount of magnetic field gives you your current flow. That's your frequency monitor. Okay, it's the isophase bus cooling system. The power coming out of the generator goes through a, a duct. Inside there's aluminum conductor. It's support insulated. Uh, you blow air through to maintain temperature on that and also heat it in the winter so you don't get any moisture build up. But each transformer is tied into this. Uh, each the bus lines go through your isophase bus. This is the generator cooling lines. While we're here, we'll mention this real quick. This is the cooling water for the hydrogen in the generator. It's mostly for cooling the rotor. These are the isophase bus ducts here. Uh, this the, down at the bottom one, this is your main power coming out. This is your generator hydrogen cooler. These are those valves we just saw. Uh, basically, it cools the hydrogen in the generator using ox cooling water. 
It's pretty much for rotor cooling as the stator is water-cooled, separate system. More of the ox cooling water to the hydrogen cooler. Have butterfly valve set the flow on it. That's going up here to the coolers. He has some drain lines to make sure nothing's leaking in the coolers inside. More of the ISO phase. Here's a generator breaker. Case low pressure feed waters. We have feed water heater 1A, 1B, and 2. These are inside the surface condenser. We'll see the ends of them. These are on the second floor. Feed water heater 3 is on the third floor. Both low pressure turbines are on the third floor. Feed water heaters increase the plant efficiency by not having to put all the steam through the plant and wasting it. Here's a feed water heater in the end of it. Uh, there's bypass valves on them. There's a tank for foam for the lube oil. Gerator valves sit right back in here. These dirty level control valves on second floor. The water there is going up to the ninth floor. Here's your pop your turbine lube oil. More fire protection equipment. Gland steam condensers right here. Any excess gland steam is condensed. Uh, pulls a slight vacuum on it so you don't have steam blowing out of the seals into the lube oil. More of the condensate system. Surface condenser sits right back in here. The turbine is one floor above us. It's one of the feed water heaters, 1A on the end of it, and they got level transmitters. If high level, they're set to dump to the surface condenser. These are bypass valves for them, back to the generator breaker. Okay, it's kind of the heart of the plant. Here's the feed water system. Have your generator, this is on ninth floor. Water comes down to your booster pumps on the second floor. These pumps run 3600 RPM. They have a gearbox on the end of the shaft. Your main feed pump will run up to 58, 25 RPM. There's a steam turbine in the middle Puts out somewhere around 14,000 horsepower. These pumps can put out um, up to 3,400 PSI. Now basically your flow path is to your booster pumps, feed water heater five, feed water heater six. The water's heated up quite a bit and increases the efficiency. It comes into your main feed pump, then it goes up to feed water heater seven, then to the boiler. There's no level control valves on this system. It's run off of the RPM of the feed pumps. It uses sealing water for sealing the main feed pump. This is the startup feed pump. This is used. There's no steam to get the plant running, it's like electric pump. And we run this, you will use a level control valve. Uh, this runs three element control, above 1400 PSI when you're running. Here's the feed pump floor. Uh, this, here's one of the main booster pumps. So some of the valving of the pump. Right back here is your steam turbine. Okay, here's your booster pump. Uh, it uses water for sealing this also. Here's your gearbox, your main turbine sits here. The high pressure turbine's on the other side of this. You have your lube oil. It's guarded oil pipe where the high pressure oil comes up through the center, feeds the bearings, and the drain goes down the outside. So if there's any leaks, it's contained. The lube oil fires are always a major concern with any kind of steam-driven equipment. Back here's more isophase bus duct. These are a lot of the drains coming back in. Uh, you get feed water heater drains coming back in, your generator drain. These are more of the feed water heaters. This is a bleeder trip valve. These are really critical in plants. The purpose of this is a check valve that makes sure it's held shut with a spring if the plant trips. It will prevent water from flashing in the feed water heaters and generator. Yeah, if that happens, it'll be enough power to drive the turbine to failure when your governor valve's closed. So it's a turbine overspeed protection. 
There's also a block valve, motor pit block valve that can be shut at high levels to keep water from going back. You don't want water going back into the turbine being disastrous. This is the high pressure feed pump here. Uh, there's two pumps in this plant. There's one this side uh, facing here. Your turbine sits here. This exhausts down to your main turbine surface condenser also. Uh, these are the sealing pressure gauges. This pump is sealed with water. It takes the booster pump flow and it feeds in to the seal. Part goes into the pump, the other part leaks out. Then you have cold water that feeds into there and that water goes to the surface condenser and um, it seals the turbine feed pump pretty good. Have some of your governor control stuff just went by. Coming up on the gland steam system. This is another thing that's kind of, you, in the plant you really can't tell much. This is the gland steam, usually you start out with aux steam. Uh, this provides steam to seal your turbine so you can pull a vacuum on it. If you didn't, air would come in past the shaft seals and it would not pull a vacuum so you use steam in there. Um, this unit becomes self-sealing higher loads there's enough leakage steam off the high pressure intermediate pressure to seal the low pressure but you start with aux you know go to the main steam once you start getting some boiler pressure built up um, then you go to the cold reheats normal makeup then when you're self-sealing there's excess steam so it goes to spill over this just dumps it back to the surface condenser here's your gland steam exhauster and the pumps on it so you can see it's pulling part of the excess steam air mixture out of the turbine to keep any air from in leaking. This is the gland steam valves. See it drawing's a whole lot better. This doesn't really make much sense looking at it. But this is the heart of the ceiling steam. Spillovers here and you have your ox steam here. Back here's the sprays for your feed pump sealing steam. You have to cool it, uh, the steam down for going into the steam seals. It's, here's your main steam lines, cold reheat and hot reheat coming from the boiler into the turbine underneath it. It's when the feed water heater block valves. Down here's the ox cooling water pumps where we were with the turbine lube oil. It's one of the main breaker locations. These are all 7,200 volt breakers. All your large motors are fed from here. To lock them out, you rack the breaker down. Uh, this exciter transformer and control. It's a static exciter, so it uses a rectified voltage to control the generator voltage. Back here's the D-Men system. Older plant used D-Men. Here's the generator stator cooling. This is kind of unique where you use water in your generator windings for cooling. Uh, it has to be very pure so it has its own resin bed in here. Uh, to get no conductivity. The water's fed up there and have Tigon tubes that feed each winding to minimize any leakage of current. This helped the generator load quite a bit as far as cooling goes. Down here's the polishers. Here's a generator cooling skid. Uh, you have your two pumps. The resin bed sits here. Some heat plate heat exchangers sit back here. Uh, this measures any air coming out of the system so you know if you have a hydrogen leak. The water is lower pressure than the hydrogen so when it leaks the hydrogen will leak into it. These are the transformers. This is the backup transformer for plant startup. Now it's like 230,000 volts coming in, dropped down to 7,200. This is the aux transformer. It takes 2,400, drops down to 7,200 volt. These are the main transformers. Each phase has a transformer. Steps up to 500,000 volts. Here's your isophase bus. I mean, bladder tank up there to maintain the oil. These have um, monitors that look for any 
gases in them. So if you have a winding problem, breakdown, you can determine the kind of gases, what's going wrong. These are the polishers. All the water from the condensate goes through these. Uh, to regenerate these, you have to move the resin over to a vessel, then you have to strip off the cat from the anion resin and use um, sulfuric acid for the cat and sodium hydroxide for the anion. Then remix them, store it, and bring it back. So it's kind of an involved process to regenerate the polishers. But if you have any raw water leaks, this will clean the water up and get rid of any impurities in the system. It's usually tube leaks that will show up here, lower run times. Got a sample station. Got sulfuric acid. Caustic set back here for regenerating these. Here's your air compressors. These are your hard to plant. You lose air. These plants are in bad shape pretty fast. They're salt air screw compressors. Here's your acid and caustic pumps. This is for D-min and polisher regenerating. Got a sip blowing air compressor back here for the air preheaters. Got the, a blaze system, uses diatomaceous earth for cleaning the water, making filtered water. Just got some chemical sumps here for getting rid of water from regeneration. Um, sip blowing air compressor transformer. Back to polishers. This kind of the turbine bay, the turbine sits up here. There's an opening where you can get turbine parts up and down. This part here is the plant emergency diesel generator. Now we have our ox boiler here. It's a Detroit. There were two 671 blocks bolted together to run this. It's kind of a unique engine. But this provides emergency power for the plant if we have a black plant. It's tested every week. Over here we have the ox boiler. This is for setting steam seals, uh, plant heating, and other uses for startup. These are the pumps for the ox boiler. This is down on the ground floor. Then you have your diesel pumps. These are front in the ox boiler and also the diesel igniters for the coal. Igniter fuel oil system. Those are those two pumps, have a fuel tank. Uh, it feeds your igniters is the big thing and also it feeds the ox boiler, the main purpose of this. Each igniter burns about three and a half gallons a minute and you got four igniters per deck. A little demand pump back here. So it's mostly fuel oil and water transfer. These are your pumps here for your circ water pump, pre lube pumps. Got heaters for the water, for the caustic, for the polisher, and the D men. You need water about 130 degrees for the resin. These are the chemical mix tanks. Just use hydrazine and ammonia hydroxide for uh, chemicals in the plant. This is the ground floor. Pulverizers on the north side, you have four. And there's also four pulverizers on the south side. You have your gearbox down here, motor. See the rollers in this one, it's down for maintenance. Basically the coal comes in, it's ground and it's blown into the boiler. Uh, each pulverizer is good for about 90 megawatts. chemical mix tanks again. Uh, back here is your lube oil for your turbine, feed pump turbines. Okay, here's your feed pump. This is your feed pump turbine. Uh, it goes through a gear reducer to your booster feed pump. Uh, this runs at 3600 RPM. Over here we have the main feed pump. Has it turning gear on it? I can monitor your vibrations and bearing temperatures. Has a lube oil cooler. Same setup as the main turbine. 
you have your AC oil pump, you have a backup AC pump, then there's a DC pump that'll run if you lose all power. Uh, bring the plant down. A slipstream with a turbine oil feeds this and you send it back for cleaning. Here's your lube oil pump for your feed pump. Um, got coolers on it. Pumps sit on top of it. Feed pumps sit right above this. These are some of the feed pump lines coming into the pumps up above. This is the bottom ash system. These pumps here produce a high flow of water which sluices out the bottom ash. Underneath here there's eductors and a cinder grinder where the ash drops down the hopper. Uh, you sluice them out twice a shift, once a week after open the doors and rot out the ash. Here's one of the jackhammers that's used for rotting. Uh, this door opens. Then you have to rake and pull out any large chunks of ash that accumulate that falls off the walls above. This is the line going out, all the ash that's crushed up, sent out to the tanks and it's hauled off and disposed of once a week. So it's kind of a dangerous job. You have to open these doors and maintain any to furnish pressure, otherwise hot gases come out. But you get large boulders that have to be broke up and removed. There's two hoppers on this. Up uh, here's one of the air ducts for the pulverizers. This thing's full of water up here, so the ash drops down to a water bath. And then, like I say, every shift you can use water nozzles and try and sluice out whatever you can get out of it. Another pulverizer's on the south side. Ox cooling water, we saw these when we first came in. Kind of a simple system, but very important. Uh, this has really clean water. So they use dirty water for the heat exchangers to cool your ox cooling water. So all your ox cooling water goes through the plant. It's fairly clean, you don't plug up heat exchangers and you don't corrode them. Uh, these are all the things that it feeds. Uh, it's temperature controlled. <clears throat> Simple system, but it, it's really critical. Here's a ex heat exchangers for the ox cooling water. I just went past a little startup feed pump back there. This is a Paul riser running ahead of bad scraper. Uh, it's about how fast they go. It's this is the gearbox down here that it sits on. There's three large wheels in there that roll. They're fixed and the table turns. Cold drops down, it's crushed. You got a pyrite hopper on this side. Anything that accumulates, it doesn't get ground. The scrapers kick out and drops down. Then you sluice that out. Right here's a pyrite hopper. So anything that rock or I mean, debris ends up down here and you can sluice it out to a tank. These little rods on the side, you can tell how much coal's on the bed. They move in and out, depends how far the roller is off the... If you can see that one moving a little bit. You can kind of tell how thick the bed is in them. They're really bad for plugging up, at which point you either got to shut the coal off and crank the air up on it, try and get the plug out. They have to have a certain temperature to run, depends on the type of coal, the temperature you need to run with, so you get a good grind on them. This is the south side of the pulverizers. There's eight pulverizers total. Aqua ammonia, this is used for pH and conductivity in the plant. And here you have your hydrogen trailer for hydrogen for the generator. This is a carbon dioxide for purging, fire suppression in silos. Here's where that bottom ash ends up in these bins that the hard ash drops out. Once a week, bring dump trucks in and load that out. These are DSI, dry sorb injection silos. They get rid of any sulfur in the gas stream. It's got your lube oil tank, dirty and clean oil tank. All the oil is centrifuge before it goes into the turbine. Down here is the water intake building. These are soot blower lance. These go in the boiler and knock out the slag buildup on the walls. They're a fairly long item. I think they're a little over 30 feet long. This is the seal well. It's the water coming out. A 
We kind of sped this section up. It's pretty boring. This is where the water comes in. Here's your service water. We haven't talked about this much. Uh, the three pumps down the intake along with your two circ water pumps. It has a traveling screen. This is the water that's used to cool your ox cooling water exchangers, those green ones we saw. Um, it runs the screen rust pumps and a bunch of items. This is just basic plant water used for various processes. But you lose this, you lose your ox cooling water and your oil is overheat, so it's pretty critical. This is inside the intake building. This is the chlorination system. Put a little bit of chlorine in the water so often to kill any clam growth and stuff in the surface condensers. Out here is the intake. You got traveling screens. Traveling screens are to filter out any large debris. Also have bar screens on here that pick out any large debris. Got rakes. We rake it with and pull out any tree limbs and. Kind of a wave breaker here. It seemed to help a lot in knocking down some of the waves and high winds. These are the traveling screens. They filter out any debris. This is stuff that got pulled up off the trash rack out front. Kind of a bar rack for large stuff. Certain times of year you get a lot of debris. Um, stuff will blow in. They can be a disaster if these screens get too much spilled up on them. They won't put, roll. The high DP pins the screen against the frame, so you have a DP on them that will run the screen so the DP gets too high. High wind and stuff blows a lot of algae and stuff in, so you gotta be aware of the conditions, how much buildup you're gonna get. This one, the service water screens. Shows how they work. You have high pressure water jets that blow through and blow any debris off the screens. It blows down to a hopper here and then it's carried out. Water returns to the reservoir and all the debris is um, disposed of. These are the traveling screens for the circ water pumps. Got a fire pump back here. These are the circ water pumps. There's two of them, each one of these. They're a, like a propeller type pump. And they'll pump about 90,000 gallons a minute. Well, 2,000 horsepower motors. Got water coming in here. It's your filter water feeding the, the shaft. They have a rubber bushing on them, so you use water for lubricating and removing any dirt from it. The bearings will fail rapidly without the water, so that's why you have trips on the pump. If you lose water, uh, the pump's designed to trip instead of damaging the bushings. You really can't see in here, it's the same type of screen. Back here, the service water pumps. Um, got ventilation panels. Got an electric fire pump and also a diesel fire pump for fire system protection. Plus carbon dioxide for the silos. Um, so this the seal outlet again. This is all the water coming out of the surface condensers. It has a seal well which minimizes the load on the circ water pumps. It creates a partial vacuum so it helps pull some of the water back. This is the DSI, dry sorbent injection system. Using Trona product, it's kind of like a baking soda, sodium hydroxide type product. Now you have a dehumidifier, runs your blowers. Any moisture in this product will plug it up. Okay, your silos. This is set to hold the sulfur level down very low. So we inject this based on the amount of sulfur. It comes in in rail cars, pneumatic cars, also get trucks. So use air pressure to unload and blow them into these silos. Got chillers back here to dry the 
here, basically dehumidifiers, have a wheel that turns, part of the wheel is heated and the rest of the wheel is cool and absorb the moisture. Feeds into the blowers. Uh, there's several, two unloading blowers and two process blowers. Got air compressors to run the system and these are the blowers for the DSI injection system. These are the silo. These are the. Here's another view of the mill. Here's your silos. You have a screw feeder. Um, the purpose of this is to maintain the sulfur down under 0.3. This is a rotary vane feeder, kind of an airlock. This is under pressure, six pounds. So if this um, it keeps air from blowing back through there, it has seals on the blades, and it, it dumps the product down here. And it's carried through the line. You have a called a Viper mill, just a high-speed mill that pulverizes it even finer, gives a little bit more efficiency. You can wash it with air and water and clean it based on high vibration and hours of run. Here it goes up into the plant. This is inside one of the silos. You have your screw feeder down below. It's the hopper gate and your screw feeders down below uh, this is feeding in uh, the required amount to minimize the sulfur emissions <coughs> your rotary vane feeder fits underneath this <coughs> that's your screw feed right there and that's from the product it's similar to baking soda they make baking soda from Trona they mine underground down in Wyoming but it works very well for removing any sulfur. <clears throat> this is the Viper meal inside. The product comes in here. This uh, makes it, grinds it very fine. It's blown out here. You have a bypass around the mill. This is all for washing the mill. It will build up on the blades inside it's kind of like a squirrel cage you have to clean it off every so often precipitator building ash farm here's your dsi uh, getting checked this over here's your economizer ash soil any economizer ash in the plant ends up here this would be all the ash on the back passes primary superheat and economizers that are knocked off by soot blowing it's transported out with air <clears throat> bottom ash is transported with water this is the fan room. These are the primary air fans. Um, these are 3,500 horsepower motors. Right now it's putting out 57 inches H2O. This feeds your pulverizers. Part of the air is bypassed. The air preheater. This is tempering air. You don't want your you want your coal around 140 degrees coming out of the pulverizer. So you have your air preheater. All right now it's like 728 degrees coming out of the air preheater. There's two of them, one feeds the north, one feeds the south. So the purpose of these is to transport the coal into the boiler and provide part of the air. These are the secondary air fans. These provide the air to the boiler. They're like a 2000 horsepower motor. Uh, we have heaters on the intake to minimize um, the cold re the temperature of the air preheater so you don't get acid dropping out on the plates you have to maintain a minimum temperature so this comes into play in the winter uh, the air from here goes into an air preheater and then it feeds your wind box uh, this goes in around the burners they're low NOx burners so the air is combustion is staged to minimize NOx formation When the primary air fans. It's a double suction fan. Got a lot of, they're quite loud. Here's your damper control for it. This is controlling the pressure of your primary air fan outlet. 
Here's your secondary air fan. There's two fans in each fan room, one's on the north side and one's on the south side. These would be the south side fans. This here's the air actually going in the boiler for combustion, it's its primary purpose. You can't see the dampers in the back there. The furnace is maintained at a slight negative pressure to keep the gases inside of it. Easy to try and maintain a negative 0.5. Here's the control for the dampers on this one. It works with the ID fans in your combustion control system to change your fans to maintain the negative draft on it. This is the other fan room. It's just like the other fan room. They pull quite a bit of air through. They have a little lube oil system in the back. Ah, uh, the oil's cooled and filtered, sent back in the bearings. The bearings have sling rings on them, but they're also um, sprays dump oil on top of the bearings, make sure there's good lubrication. Back here's the fra, the air and light heaters. This is where the air is heated coming in. Um, using oil solution for heating the air, so if we're about it freezing. Here, back out the pulverizers on the north side. Here's a pulverizer. Uh, you have a lube oil pump that circulates the gear oil. You have a motor, about 800 horsepower motor driving the gearbox. You use inerting steam and sweeping steam. These are used for starts and shutdowns to inert the pulverizer to get rid of any combustion. If you have any smoldering coal or anything, you'll put it out. Now you have your hot air comes in, it meets, mixed with your tempering air. This temperature here is trying to maintain 150 on this unit. So you're feeding hot air and cold air together. Depends on the amount of moisture in the coal. Um, the temperature coming out, how much drying it has to do. You got your guillotine damper and flow and another. This is your main flow control damper. Try and maintain the amount of air flow versus your coal flow. Coal silo sits up here. Have your outlet valve, here's a coal feeder. It's a gravimetric feeder. Uh, maintain so much coal in the belt and change the belt speed to change your coal feed. Coming out, you have your burner shutoffs. Now, these are protection valves that shut each of the coal conduits off. Sleeve dampers, these are part of the combustion control. These control how the air is being fed in around the burners. Have your igniters, um, basically, flame scanner. That's the key on these things is the DP. If you get high DP on these above 30 or someone starts climbing, you know you're plugging up, the coals is building up, it isn't going anywhere. So at that point, you either have to shut, increase the air and shut the coal down, uh, try and get it cleaned out. All these bearings, everything have um, seal air on them. So they're feeding air in, tempering air in to keep the coal dust out of all the bearings on the, the rollers and um, all the moving parts on the pulverizer. This is the some of the coal that's come out of the pulverizer open up doors and blow them out occasionally. Some of the build up. Sometimes they do start plugging up, and you have to open up the pyrite hopper and blow them out. It's your pyrite hopper down here, the water. There's your duct back here, hot air duct coming down that side. 
You have your controls here that show different DPs, pressures on it. Bottom mass shacks over here. See when the scraper bar is in there. <laughs> Here's your seal there coming in, feeling the table seal. Here's your air feeding in the pulverizer in the backside, and you got your sweeping steam and sealing steam coming in, inerting and You see the little lines here. This is seal air coming in, keeping any coldness buildup. Here's where your DP and uh, different pressures are come from. Seal air to the table, blows air around the bottom to keep the cold dust in them from coming down the gearbox. Back here's the bottom ash. This is the air going into the pulverizer. These are some of the pitot tubes for measuring airflow. We're coming up on top of it. This is the hot air duct feeding in. This is the cold air site over here coming in. Then the hot air feeds in here. This is the mix box. From here it goes down to the pulverizer. These are the lines coming out of the pulverizer. Each one has a BSO. These are the four lines feeding the four burners. One pulverizer feeds one deck of burners. Your temperature probes right here. Your coal feeds down the center. Pulverized coal comes up the outside. These are some coal flow orifice valves. We didn't quit using them. They just left them full open. These are the main burner shutoff valves. These are critical for safety. I kind of sped this section up, it was boring. <laughs> Here's your steam turbine up in the third floor. Say you have your IP, HP, and two LP turbines. Each one of these have their own surface condenser. Um, there's hood sprays for low load operation startup where you spray water, keep more heat in the last stage blading. Not enough steam flow, you'll overheat the blades. Uh, different steam temperatures, steam chest. Basically, here's your steam comes in your trip valves, and here's your reheat. These are reheat intercepts, reheat stops. This just kind of shows an overview of the layout of the turbine. Okay, here's your generator. It used to be a dynamic exciter, it's changed to a static exciter, so there's just brushes in here. You have uh, two LP turbines. Up here is winding vibration monitoring stuff that was added. Here's your head tank for your stator cooling. You have your pressure. This is feed water heater three, feed water heater seven sits back there. High pressure turbines back here along with the IP. This is where your brushes are in here. Once a week you gotta check brushes, change out brushes. This had quite a few brushes on it. This one's pulling quite a bit of current. You have plus and minus two different sides of the DC. DC feeds the rotor on these. Um, you can use that for adjusting your power factor and also your voltage. When you're running you'll you have to adjust the power factor sometimes depending on the line frequency. Here's one of the lift pumps. It just uses part of the lube oil and puts some high pressure on it the bearing and floats it. Your seals sit back in here. The generator and uh, part of seal oil is back in here underneath there we can't see. It's still in the generator. Here's a nameplate on the generator. You can pull over 16,000 amps out, 24,000 volts, so that's kind of impressive. Turning gear sits back here. When the unit shuts down, you have to keep it on turning gear so you don't bow your rotors. Uh, the bottom's cold and the top's hot. You can do damage to them, so as soon as it slows down, it goes on turning gear. 
Then your lift pumps run to make sure that the shaft isn't rubbing on the bearings. This low pressure turbine. Here's the low pressure turbine. <clears throat> you have a fire system on these. A uh, temperature sensor has to trip and then the little glass bulb has to get hot and break. So there's two modes of tripping so you don't dump water on it for false alarms. Big thing with these is lube oil fires. So it's part of the fire system here. And there's also vibration probes, temperature probes on it. Anything over 10 mils will trip it. Okay, this is the DH unit overview. This shows the governor valve positions. Um, there's eight governor valves, four on each side, feeding the high pressure turbine. The throttle valves that had the governor valves, they're the one that trip valves. For plant startup, these are used to throttle the steam flow. There's a little pilot valve inside that opens. Uh, bring the turbine up to sink speed on these. About 34, 50, you'll swap over to governor valves, do a valve transfer. There's a lot involved with temperatures and how quick things are heating up. A lot of thick metal, so temperatures are really critical. Uh, net megawatt, 605, we're putting out 583. 12 megavars plus. Like I say, you can use your voltage control to adjust the vars. Here's you just let it float. You have your intercept valves for them. These are for the reheat and two reheat stop valves. Every two weeks, all these valves are tested to make sure that they work correctly. It's really critical with steam turbines to have valves that aren't hanging up. This is the throttle valve. Your governor valve set right back here. There's eight of them. Have a little Moog controller inside them that adjusts it. They're very accurate valves and these things shut in milliseconds. So if there's a trip, the higher spring pressure will slam these things shut. This is the high pressure steam coming in through the governor feeding the high pressure turbine. From here it goes back to the boiler and comes back as hot reheat on the back end. And that is fed into the IP turbine. Right here is hot reheat coming in. Reheat stop bells are here. Intercept set up here, two sets of valves. So this is hot reheat coming back in. From here, the hot reheat goes to low pressure turbines. Also is used to feed the feed pump turbines. Your main lube oil pump sits right back here. These are some of the trip circuits for loop vacuum and lube oil pressure. Here's your high pressure feed water heaters. Um, five, six, and seven generators considered in the circuit. These are your BTVs, bleeder trip valves. These are critical for preventing steam from these feed water heaters flashing, going back in and driving the turbine to overspeed if it trips offline. Uh, these block valves will close if you have high level in your feed water heaters. High feed water heater level, your drain valves open, um, the upstream will shut off this one will start dumping too. So these really increase the efficiency of the plant. This feed water heater seven, feed three. These are your steam lines going back to the boiler over here. Um, reheat coming in, reheat stop, intercepts, governor valves here. The breakers and everything else sit on down the second floor underneath here, and the feed pumps are down the second floor underneath this. It's one of your trip panels for your feed water heater if you have high level. The pressure on the tubes here is around 3,000 pounds or so, going up to the boiler. The boiler runs about 2,400 psi, so you have to have your feed water high enough to get the water in there. These are the coal conduits coming out the pulverizers, like feed water heater six and five sits back here. They have bypasses on them and a lot of valves. Each pulverizer will have four of these ducts feeding the burners up above. Control room sits back in here. This is floor three, kind of your main floor with the turbine on it. Uh, the coal feeders are on this floor. and quite a few of the feed water heaters.
uh, control room, you have your sit blowing screen, this is your main electrical panel board, uh, showing your burners, your, the flame scanners, coal silos, got your alarm screen, uh, various generator protection screens. That's what the control room looks like running this plant. It used to be a panel board and it's converted to DCS quite a while ago. Here's the lab, which is critical for water chemistry. As when the water chemistry screens, pH is critical. You look at cat conductivity. Uh, this tells you if you have, you're really worried about sodium and silica in your steam is that so played out on your turbines and create a lot of problems. Dissolved oxygens, a big one. Most of you are concerned with pH, conductivity, and oxygen. Um, this can tell you, you know, if you have a feed water leak. If over here, if you start getting high conductivity, you know you have a tube leaking your feed water, dumping raw water in. Economizing on that much, looking at the hydrazine feed dissolved oxygen. This tell you how well your generator is working. The feed water heater 5 sent everything back up to the boiler so that's kind of important to make sure you have good water going back. Chemistry lab. Every shift you have to do samples just verify your instrumentation is working correctly. Now this has a chiller to maintain the water about 70 degrees. Sample temperature is critical. You'll use Ox cooling water for part of it, then a water bath. Try and maintain as accurate water temperature as you can for your sample. That way you get an accurate pH. Back here you have column, cat columns for getting the cat conductivity. I can see the color change down here. It's exhausted, the yellow, purples, it's still good. Uh, so we do conductivities, dissolved oxygen. This is what's shown up on that control room screen, all these transmitters. Kind of the adjustments on it, that's sodium. I got temperatures and pressures on it. You have 2400 PSI come down here. So you have to drop the pressure down. Um, so you can run the samples on it. See the sample temperature is pretty critical. Filtered water tank. <laughs> kind of the chemistry lab where the analysis are run on everything. Just showing some of the plant screens you can see in there. Can't control anything, but uh, if you're in a lab, you need to know the plant loads. There's a lot of screens can be accessed just from one screen by clicking on them. So. Next one, the coal feeders. Uh, this one shut down. The door sealed tight because there's pressure on these from the pulverizer. You have a belt in here, drag chain on the bottom. Uh, a certain amount of coal is put on the belt. There's a little bar that maintains the coal on the belt. The bar will move up and down to maintain the coal loading on the belt. Then you just change the speed of the belt to determine the coal flow. They're using they're called gravimetric feeders. They work pretty good on the feed rates of the plant. When you shut down, you got to wash them out. I agree with you, cold buildup in them. Yeah. Have an elevator, which is the godsend. There's 19 floors, it's about 200 feet to the top. Probably a little over 200 feet. We're at the top of the boiler now. This is 
the aux steam. We're running various plant loads and coming in. So this will be the 19th floor. These are the boiler safeties. Um, these will go last. First ones to blow are right off the boiler. Electromatic valves. Uh, these go first. That we keep steam flow through the boiler. Use your outlet valves. It's designed to go first to maintain steam flow through the superheater. You have two steam lines come out. They connect to one further down. Back here is called the penthouse. Inside's all the connection for the division walls, superheat, plattens. This one, the superheat finishing sprays. This maintains 1,005 degrees on the outlet. Uh, it sprays before the superheater. That way there's no moisture getting through it. But these are set to maintain about 1,005 outlet. They're on a program, so lower loads. It'll be a little bit less. That's the top of the boiler. Uh, the whole boiler is hung off the beams on top. Another set of boiler safeties. Every year these are tested. I think they're set for around 2900 PSI. This is the top of the boiler. I can see these rods are going down there holding up the steam drum and all the different tube sections. Kind of an overview of the roof. Got a coal train laid down. That's the DSI, the water come by. Got your D-man condensate tank. This shows the bottom ash. Water gets loosed out here and it settles out. The water's recirculated, comes back in. So you send the water out here, clean it up, and comes back in the plant so it's just recirculated. So really the only thing going out is just cooling water. That's the fly ash silo, the fly ash out of the precip ends up here. And it's shipped off. It used to be used cement plants would take it. We started adding carbon to get rid of the mercury, then it made the product less valuable. Here's the coal yard. That's the preset building down here, moving your particulate. Uh, these are the conveyors bringing the coal up. You have two conveyors. They could burn about 350 tons an hour. I uh, hear the reclaimers. Their big wheel goes and they'll cut this ditch. They push this ditch in with cats and the thing runs along automatically and uh, sends the coal in the plant as you need it. These two bins here where the bottom ash ends up then over here the clarifiers they knock out any uh, finer particulate and it's returned the bottom ash hopper and settled out part of a coal train they're watering the coal down it has to be kept moist and packed so you don't have any fires you can see it's right now it's not really reclaiming it the bins are full but they push in fill this up and then this thing this one runs automatically and the other one you have to manually run it That's the dumper building out here. It's called a lowering well here, any excess coal flowing dump out there. But this is um, on day shift, just running the number three. Got an emergency feed here. If you lose both of your reclaimer stackers, you can push coal in and feed it, so. All the aluminum rail cars are aluminum cars, so they carry more weight and they um, have rotating couplers on them. So the clamps grab the top, then they roll the car over and everything dumps out the top. It takes about 180 seconds to dump a car. Around 100 tons of coal. <clears throat> uh, 
Up here is where the stack emissions are monitored. Is there anything leaving this plant? Um, really watch close. Mercury, sulfur, nitrous oxides, carbon monoxide. You can look at COO2, moisture. So any emissions are monitored particulate. That's filtered water tank down here. It's part of a train laid down here. Usually they run three trains. So we got one laid down here. Somewhere around 110 cars in a train. Um, we got your 500,000 volt line leaving back here. That's your coal conveyors coming up here. Naturox boiler stack. Got roof fans. Building gets pretty hot inside. Summertime, it can get really hot. Okay, it's back to the boiler penthouse. It's the sip blowing over here. Uh, the steam for the sip blowers is pressure controlled and flow controlled for each blower, depending on how hard you need to blow that section of boiler. Inside here is all the piping for the top of the boiler. The actual top of the boiler is a little ways below here. This is the sip blowing. This just shows a little bit of the sip blowing screen. You have division walls, bull nose, finishing superheat. Basically, steam comes out of the drum through the top roof tubes. Primary superheat. Uh, it's fed back division walls. It's sprayed down about 860 degrees for his division walls. From here, it comes off. Those sprays we saw on top, they spray it down for the finishing superheat to about 1,005 on the outlet. Comes out, you have a primary superheat, upper economizer. The back box is two separate sections. You got the reheater on the back. We can say the primary superheat and upper economizer. Lower economizer sets an outlet of this. There's dampers that maintain the flow. They'll change the flow between these two sections to maintain reheat temperature. Uh, sip blowing is critical. These things can plug really quick. Depends on the kind of coal you're burning. Uh, even the amount of excess air can be a major factor in this. So sip blowing runs pretty much continuous. Uh, it took some around 30,000 gallons an hour of water to run all the sip blowing. More of the sip blower flow control, pressure control. This comes off the intermediate or the division wall header. Pressure's let down. These are flow control. Here's your boiler water and your steam drum. Uh, this shows your feed water heater. Basically, feed water heater seven coming in. Lower economizer, upper economizer it goes into the drum. Um, comes up the primary superheat division walls, finishing super. Like we said, you have your two safeties downstream. Uh, slipstream of the water is blown off all the time, continuous blow down. This goes back to the surface condenser and the polishers clean it up. Basically this, you can um, Here's your steam drum, feed water going in, comes in both sides, manway. Uh, these are part of the level control. These are pressure transmitters, your level control transmitters sit down below. Basically measure the weight of the water, gives you your level. This is just a quick overview of the sprays off your feed pumps. There's a separate stage that puts out high pressure water around 3,500 that feeds these sprays. You have your five sections in the feed pump provide the water to the boiler. Then there's another little booster stage that provides high pressure water for your sprays. Now this shows your dampers reheat, superheat damper, uh, reheat out. You're spraying down your 
steam going to division walls and the spring again going to the finishing superheat. We're limited on the metal as the temperatures you can run at. These are just block valves for the sprays up there on 19. There's a lot of little samples on the drum so you can check the drum's water. A constant stream of water goes to the lab all the time for analysis. At full load, you don't have to spray much. The steam flows enough to cool it. Got your ox steam here. This is used uh, for basic plant steam loads. This is used for startup. Usually it comes off the cold reheat down the first floor. So for plant startup, you'll run this. The other side of the drum, feed wire going in, feed wire feeds both sides of the drum. This is a sip blower. Oh, there's a lot of sip blowers in this place, as that one screen showed. Basically, these drive in, there's a motor that drives it, turns it, and there's also a track drive that runs it in there. You have to have steam flow on them. Now, if these hang up in the boiler, they won't last very long, so you keep steam on them. This one's coming back out, there's a little packing on it. If they quit running, you have to use a pneumatic wrench and try to turn these things by hand and drive them out. Easier laying on your back on the floor and it's hot. But the lances, if they go in and stick, they will bend. They usually work pretty good, but sit blowing is a continuous process. So they, um, this guy here is running. You can see him going in. A little bit of water comes out and packing. They just have a rope packing on these guys. There's a valve when they start going, it opens up the valve. These are the bigger soap blowers IK. These are the smart blowers, clean division walls and finishing superheat. These you can control how much they turn, how far they go in when they spray. Okay. Here's this inside the soap blower. There's a track on both sides, gear driven track. It drives it in, then the motor turns it, chain driven. They're really critical sometimes with bad coal. Uh, this thing could plug fairly quickly. You can inspect the division walls here. These are the down comers out of the steam drum going down to the bottom of the wind box fitting the water walls and the boiler. The boiler is a welded tube construction membrane, so there's hardly any refractory inside. It's all tube. It will build up slags. So use water cannons to knock the slag off in the firebox. And soot blowing is on the back. The soot blowers mostly will drop it down to the economizer ash down the bottom of those two back sections. Then it's ground up and sent out by air. Here's inside the fire. This here's an acoustic monitor looking for tube leaks. It measures high frequency, so if a tube leak it could still is high frequency. The fire is blinding looking at, so this is through a number five shade. Anything white in there is a little bit of slag buildup. It's critical to keep an eye on the finishing superheat because this leg will build up and bridge across the tubes. Once you get behind on sip blowing, it's really hard to correct the problem. More down comers, these same down comers. Uh, boiler sits back here. These are going down the very bottom of the boiler, feed the water walls. As the boiler moves about 11 and a half inches from cold to hot, there's a lot of expansion built into this thing. The bottom is still in a water trough. There's some plates and sitting down a water trough that keeps a negative pressure on the boiler and the boiler can also grow down. Usually these plants, it's better to go take the elevator to the top than walk down. Got some, this is the O2 monitoring screen. I monitor O2 across the boiler. You can change this by um, changing the dampers on pulverizers. 
or use over fire air to knock down NOx. But this is showing the oxygen right now going out of the boiler. More oxygen probes. These are actually oxygen CO probes. More soot blowers, there's lots of soot blowers. Once this thing starts plugging, it's it's a nightmare. Got a lot of access doors for maintenance to go and um, repair. A lot of these soot blowers, they change with water cannons. They had um, four water cans that clean the water walls instead of using the water blaster soot blowers. Water cans work pretty good. These high pressure jet of water and they'd clean certain patterns inside the firebox so you could knock slag off the walls. You get a lot of build up on slag, especially around the burners. Some of the slag can build out six to eight feet from them. You get big sheets that fall off. Uh, it ends up down below, then it'll mix it hard to get the ash out. So the kind of coal you burn is critical. This little pitch here just shows the generator vents. A little bit of um, steam is vented off. Down here is the gland steam vent a little bit off. Turbine buildings down there. You want a slight amount of steam coming out of your generator vents. For startup, there's vents open around them to try and get all the air out you can. See, a bunch has had to be sped up. It's just too boring. Got a pipe hanger. When you shut down, you have to um, block all the pipe hangers to keep the weight off the pipelines. This is one of the sprays for a division wall. Two sets of called the temperators or sprays, depends where you work. But this is controlling temperature 860 degrees going to division walls. These are more of the down comers with water from this steam drum coming down. Anything above 2400 PSI is the difference between steam and water becomes less and less and you start losing your circulation. This is a natural circulating boiler. So you can run a little bit over 2400. The pipe hangers have two marks. You have a red mark when they're hot and another one when they're cold. So you can see the amount of loading on the pipe hangers as it heats up. You get different loading on the pipe. This is the dampers from the primary superheat reheat sections. This controls temperature of the reheater. These work in conjunction, one open, one close. After reheat gets cold, this opens up more. If it gets hot, it'll close down. You have to spray more on your primary superheat. <clears throat> but this is what controls the reheat temperature of these dampers. They go way across the boiler. There's a set on both sides. Getting back to the air preheater section, this exhaust gas leaving the boiler. And it's feed water coming in. You have your little startup valve. For startup, there's only a valve in the system. The rest of it's block valves. Your feed pumps control the feed water to the drum. This is going to the lower economizer right here. It's not really shown in the drawings, but this is upper economizer sits back up here. It's in the high pressure steam lines. Down here's one of the coal silos. This in here is the coal gallery. This holds about 400 tons of coal. <clears throat> this is what you feed out of through the feeder to the pulverizer that runs to the boiler. <clears throat> 
Got a lot of drain valves. These are drain valves for shutdown. There's quite a few valves. It takes a little while to drain this thing. Holds around 150,000 gallons of water. Here's some of the old water um, blowers. The water cans made them pretty much obsolete. That there's one of the water cannons. A uh, little nozzle here. Uses high pressure water. This rotates X and Y. And it'll send a jet of water on a predefined pattern in the boiler. So you can set these to how hard you blow. Um, from visual inspection, you kind of know where this leg's building up and how hard to hit. They will swing the boiler pressure. And that cold water hitting the tubes will swing it a little bit. So if you get a big swing, you know it's pretty clean. There's four of these total. This is the deaerator. Here's Rock's cooling water head tank. Uh, the deaerator storage tank sits down below. The actual deaerator sits above. These are more downcomers feeding down to the wind box. Wind box starts right about here, floor nine. These go up to the drum. Um, some old water cannon blowers, water soap blowers. Deerator drum holds about three minutes of water at full load. Ox cooling head tank maintains posture pressure in ox cooling water. Up here's your deerator. It uses cold reheat steam. Uh, you get back steam from your continuous blowdown tank. Feed water heater five comes back to here. A lot of your feed water heater drains come back to here. You got your recirc valves off your feed pumps. It's critical to keep flow through the pumps. So these are set at low flow, they'll open up and maintain flow. This is your um, blowdown tank. Water comes out of the boiler. Slipstream, the water that doesn't flash to steam goes to the surface condenser. Steam feeds the deaerator. Maintains boiler water purity, you don't concentrate um, chemicals in it. Different elements. So the recirc valves for the feed pump set up here. Usually you have your valves close to the low pressure so you don't get a lot of flashing and hammering in the pipe. That one screen, you notice on the second floor there's a lot of valves for deer drains, a lot of the stuff went down there. That way you don't have the pressure drop going to a vacuum. You want those as close as you can to the vacuum. These are over fire airports, they help control knocks. This is level on the storage tank, low level will trip your feed pumps off, but this holds the water from here goes down to your feed pump booster pumps. We're on deck nine, feed pumps run deck two, so there's a little bit of head pressure on it. Here's the steam going into it. For startup you can use ox boiler steam called pegging steam and feed in here and heat the water up in the boiler before you start filling the boiler. Usually it's cold reheat steam coming back from the steam turbines used. So for startup, your ox boiler will heat up the feed water for the boiler. You want at least 220 degrees to keep recirculating it through the deaerator to get the water as clean as you can, no oxygen. This is the coal feed. You have a distribution bin. This sat outside the plant there where the coal chutes come into there. Um, basically have belts filled each of the silos. They hold about 450 tons of coal. Control silo. This tells you what silo it's looking at. When this level gets down to a certain amount, it starts the belts up and then it fills them. So it pretty much runs automatic. This is the coal feeders up here. This is the coal that's dropping in down there. 
I think it's running right now. You can see the coal drop down to the silo. It's pretty fine coming in. It's... I don't know how to describe it. Kind of like dirt with a little bit of rock in it. It's low sulfur coal. That's cascading. It fills one silo and fills the next and next and next. Goes down till the control silo gets full then it shuts it down. This is the coal going into the silo coming in out of the yard. They're detectors in case something plugs up, he'll shut down the system. That's the stuff right there. It's kind of like dirt with some gravel thrown in it. It's real wet. That's why you gotta have the hot air and the pulverizer to dry it. And you can tell how much water's in your coal in the winter time by how much your hot air damper's open or your tempering air damper's closed. These little rollers, it's called the belt and alignment. There's also switches I'll trip it if the belt comes out of misalignment. And also detectors, if one of the chutes plug up, you'll shut it down. This is washed down. Most of this plant's washed down. Um, every month, the whole building's washed down. The coal gallery's washed down about every day to minimize any coal dust. So these plants, this plant is really very clean. So we really stayed up on the housekeeping, did a lot of washdowns. They're used, carbon dioxide can be used in earth silos if you have a silo that gets a hot spot in it. These are the coal silos. Have weight cells on the bottom, tell you how much coal's in them, the weight. From here it's going down to the feeder on the third floor, then down to the pulverizer. It sits underneath that. fire again. That's how it looks without any mask. There's a lot of radiant heat that's picked up in the water walls. See some of the slag building up on it. The danger about this is if this thing goes positive, it'll throw fire back at you. You can see a little slag on these. Um, this is looking through a number five welding shade. You can see some build up. Here's an eyebrow really see. This is getting too hot for the camera so we had to kind of quit. But you need to check the furnace um, for build up and plugging up like the finishing superheat division walls. Build a lot of weight on those. See the water cannons knocks the slag off in big sheets. It's kind of like rock ends up down in the hopper. Then it's either sluiced out or builds up. Then once a week you open it up and um, jackhammer it out and drop down the cinder grinder. It grinds it up and it's sluiced out to those tanks. Say the NOx is controlled by the burners or low NOx burners. Then you use over fire air to um, keep the NOx within specs. You're adding trona for sulfur and carbon, then another product that gets rid of the mercury out of the flue gas. Any CO, you can pick that up and adjust um, dampers and individual pulverizer burners. You can see when I hear a buildup, this is one of the eyebrows building up from slag. It builds up and it'll get hot and drip like wax as it slowly melts. But it's a pretty intense fire. If you blow a tube, this thing goes positive and it'll throw um, fire out of the boiler, any, any openings. There's so many tubes in this thing, do have some tube fires. This is economizer ash. These are air cannons to knock it down. This is where all the ash ends up from the primary Superheat, reheat areas underneath those dampers. It drops down here, these hoppers. Uh, it goes down here to grinders. <clears throat> so this is a, in case it plugs, you can open this up, try and rot it out, evacuate it. This is one of the coal burners. This is your coal coming in. 
I'll probably see this better later. <clears throat> but here's one of your coal conduits, burner. Use diesel igniter here to light it. You have sleeve dampers that you can use to adjust the airflow. A lot of these other dampers are set to give you low knocks. They change the spin of the air around the outside of the burner. This is your sleeve damper and igniter sits here. This goes in, it lights, burn about three gallons a minute of diesel, light the, the coal off. Has flame scanners, one for the coal, another one for the igniter. Here's one of the scanners right here for the coal. This whole thing gets washed off, I see, every week. These will feed from like 20,000 pounds to 135,000 pounds an hour of coal. That's a little air can try and knock down any buildup. This is what some of the ash looks like coming out of the condomizer. Stuff builds up on the back tubes. It's kind of porous. The soot blowers are pretty good at knocking it off. Sometimes they'll be really hot, come down there almost molten and start building up. But all this ash here is everything on the back passes of the boiler. There's grates in here uh, to catch any debris coming down. Especially after plant startups, there's all kinds of stuff that comes down. This barrel just shows some of the stuff you find. Uh, it's kind of handy. You can tell what parts of the boiler, you know, I may have lost some little, these are shields and a few little things. Nothing critical. It could even be stuff from repairs that got left in there. This is the cinder grinder. It comes down here. It's a little grinding wheel that grinds it up. Uh, it drops down here to a Nuva feeder. It uses air pressure and the valves open close and it pushes it out to a pneumatic transport line, sends it out to that tank out back. When the soot blower is blowing over here, you can see a lot of red hot sparks come down. These things are notorious for plugging up, so you have to kind of pay attention or your line will plug up on you. But this is called economizer ash, it's the friable ash. Your bottom ash is the hard molten rock-like stuff, and then the fly ash is the real fine particulate. It's about like cement. An interesting fact on this, if you used your radio on some of these decks, you'd trip off the pulverizer. The burner would trip because the radio frequency interfered with the uh, flame scanner's signal. Something you wouldn't think about, but you gotta be careful you run radios and plants. Got a lot of fire pictures, but you really can't see much, but. Yeah, the oxygen concentration is about 2% coming out, 2.5. Very little CO. <laughs> you can kind of see an eyebrow around when the burner's there, sort of. <clears throat> it's just a big buildup around the burner. When the plant shuts down, they'll use dynamite and knock all the slag off before they go in there. They'll bring blasters in, use prime accord or dynamite, and try and knock all the slag off. We're back to the bottom of the coal silo. There's eight of these. They feed four pole risers on each side. Got your air coming down. That's the hot air duct. Here's your cold air duct coming in. This bypasses the air preheater. See some more coal conduits coming out of the pole risers. Feeding in down here's your air going into the pole riser and mix box. This is the air preheater, about deck four. The air preheaters, they take the flue gas, um, basically take the heat out of the flue gas and heat the air coming in. There's a bunch of baskets in there that slowly turn. Uh, flue gas comes down, the air comes up the other side and transfers the heat across. <clears throat> uh, back to more DSI. 
from the mill. It's injected uh, back here. This gets rid of any sulfur in the flue gas. Then it's picked up in the precipitator. These have all the numbers, same as errors. They can always look at the numbers. You got carbon going in here, and this is Trona feeding in here, DSI. Activated carbon was used for mercury control, and this is used for sulfur control. These lines will get holes in them, so you have to occasionally go up there and splice them. You see there's quite a bit of Trona back here. Surprisingly, that Trona is like real fine powder, but it would eat through the rubber hoses in time. And you had to make sure the nozzles weren't plugging up on it. You need to really even feed a Trona and carbon to do a good job with emissions. <clears throat> that was an actual air preheater. Now we're underneath the air preheater. These are the outlet dampers underneath it. This is the air coming up through it. Right here's one of the bearings for the basket. These are like 28 feet across. The primary air preheater is a little bit smaller. This one here, you can actually see the baskets moving in there. It's kind of hard to see this part, so we sped a lot of this up and got rid of it. We left a lot of this stuff sped up just to get an idea how far we traveled for different areas. Okay, these are the baskets moving inside the air preheater. You can see the honeycomb structure of the basket. These are steel. Uh, these are the scraper bars come across to form an airtight seal. So they're coming out of the, the flue gas. They're real hot and they're going over here and they're heating up the air going back to the furnace. So the air, the flue gas coming out 800 degrees or more. And then it leaves here. You want it down to under 280 degrees or so for the air preheater for the precipitator. You don't want this to get too cold because you'll drop acid gases out on the plating. Water moisture build up on them and get corrosion. So you use the frost system to ensure that the air coming in is warm enough so you don't drop out moisture on the plates in there and also cause plugging. Use high pressure air to blow the soot off the air preheaters. There's four of them total, two primary, two secondary motor drives. This is the fan control. Over here you have the emissions. Try to maintain sulfur under a three. Mercury was almost nothing. Um, you have your dampers, you have to control your flow of the primary air preheaters to hold down the temperature. Here's your four air preheaters. This is the precipitator. These are your four ID fans. These are variable frequency drive. Um, these are about 3,500 horsepower motors. So these work with the primary and secondary air and the fuel feed to um, maintain negative 0.5 inches draft. It's kind of critical with the temperatures and the cold to get precipitators to work well. These were a uh, different injection using phosphoric acid solution, trying for a different coal they were burning, try to get the precip to run better. This is feeding into the precipitator. Uh, these are the TRs, transformer rectifiers, that put around 50,000 volts that feed the plates. The particles come in, they're charged with a negative charge, and then the plates are positive. They have wrappers that uh, knock the particulate off the plates. So these are each TRs. Each section or module had 
two TRs on the inlet because that was high loading. And then the back only had one. It was more of a polishing effect. There's a little bit of dust today. I had a problem with it. Usually you couldn't even see anything coming out of it. This is one of the wrapper rooms. These are the Kirk key system on this, where you had your keys had to unlock one thing and go and lock the other and lock the other just for safety. This is the wrapper room. They have rods that'll drop and knock off the ash build up on the plates. It goes down to Nuva feeders and feeds out. This is kind of electrostatic precipitator. Like this one here had two TRs feed the this section. Had two TRs, so there's a lot more particulate removal coming in. Out here it just ran one. From here it dropped down to a, a hopper. Then a Nuva feeder used it to pneumatic transport. This shows part of the wrapper drive room. These are knocking off the plates. These were knocking off the grid. So this is to um, knock on any particulate and the flue gas. Like I say, it was used for cement products for a lot of years. Then we started adding a lot of carbon for mercury control. And it wasn't used quite as much. But temperature of the flue gas is critical, and then the coal you're burning, how much sodium is in it, uh, different components. But this is all protected by the Kirk key. You had to take a key from up above and go to the transformer and lock that out, and take the key somewhere else, and then try to lock doors. And so you couldn't just get into these rooms because they're high voltage, 50,000 volt wires run right above your head in here. These are just wrapper motor breakers. They were set to run on timers. And the actual TRs were optimized to look at the power requirements. This is the screen for the TR sets. This is what the individual controllers were looking at sparks per minute, arcs per minute, had primary current, secondary current, firing angle, this um, showed how hard they were running. This sent the power out to the TR sets, which were transformer rectifiers. Uh, usually this would run in optimization mode, where it try and maintain the least amount of power to effectively do the job. If you had high ash levels, you'd trip them offline or any moisture in this system was detrimental to turn the flash to cement. This is one of the screens showing the TR set. Down here we have the ID fans, ID fan damper stack. Up here's where the emissions were monitored. You have a flash dome over here. The silo of the flash was sold to a private contractor. That's the breaching coming out of the ID fans. Over here you have the coal conduit tubes with the conveyor belts inside there. Now we're heading down the bottom of the precipitator. This is the second floor of the precipitator. These are the ash hoppers. That's where the ash ends up. They have high level. This is the equalizing line going down to the Nuva feeder. They had probes for high level, and then there's a man way to open these up. Up here's the gate feeding the Nuva feeder down here. Kicked up a little bit of ash going in there. During outages, you have to open them up and remove any rocks from moisture built up in there. I inspect the plates and grids. This is a Nuva, this is the transport line coming out of these Anuva feeders. The uh, Nuva feeders, there's a gate on top it shuts, then it equalizes the pressure. Uh, then it builds up pressure in here, then this gate opens and dumps it 
So their uh, transport unit takes from negative pressure to a positive 5-6 psi line pressure. So all your flash is fit out here. They'll fill up about oh, this full, then they dump. So you're constantly checking them, make sure they weren't malfunctioning. This is activated carbon. These are the blower motors. They had a feeder that would dump the product in behind to an inductor, and this is blown in to remove any mercury in the flue gas. It's really a black mess. Anytime you got near this thing, you got black. But yes, the easy two feeders were ran at a time. And the product dropped in down here out of the silo in the back. So a little adductor, the blower would blow through there and he'd grab the carbon and blow it in. This is based on the amount of mercury and it would adjust. Here's your ID fans double suction fan you have the motor it's 3500 horsepower 7200 volts they're vfd driven these didn't have turning gear on them because you could run them about 60 hertz using the vfds they weren't a real fast motor pretty big fans and here's the vfd room here's the vfd for one fan Now the other one sits back here. There are four of these total. Each fan had one of these. They work pretty good. Your fan speed would change along with your fan dampers to maintain the boiler pressure. Slight negative. This is one of the lube oil units. It has a fan on it for cooling the oil and filters. The oil is fed up to the bearings. Now there's sling rings in the bearings. And this sprayed on top of the bearing can help cool the bearing and remove any particulate. There's quite a bit of heat in this shaft, so um, oil is mostly for a coolant. This is the base of the stack. Uh, there's a breaching that goes in here. You have your duct feeding on both sides. And then there's a steel duct that goes up through the center. You have an escape ladder, and here's the elevator on this side to go up to the platform for the emissions control equipment. So if you ever got stuck, they had to climb down the ladder. The stack was about 650 feet tall. So it's all the flue gas heading up it. That's the elevator. There's more of the ID fans, the other two ID fans. <clears throat> like all motors, they had temperature and vibration probes on them. Out here's the flash silo. This is loading pneumatic trucks. These are the bottom ash hoppers. That's where all the bottom ash would end up out of the hopper in the furnace. Either the flash either went to the silo or the dome. They're both loaded into trucks. Here's the bottom the bottom ash hopper. Every week this is dumped out into dump trucks. One side would fill one week, the other side would fill the next week. This is what the stuff looked like coming out if it went through the grinder on the ground. It was ground up about gravel size. It started out as a fairly hard rock. So it's transported out with water. All this water was reclaimed. It overflowed. The bottom ash hoppers went over here to the clarifier and surge tank. Any sludge that accumulated was pumped off and sent back up to the bottom ash hopper where it dropped out. He added a product to keep calcium from building up and also help drop out the particulate. These are the research pumps. They take the water and send it back into the plant for bottom ash sluicing. 
and keeping the seal trough sprayed. The bottom of that hopper is full of water for any hot ash coming down to cool it.